Dear participants, welcome to the Nordic webinar, Reducing Global Biodiversity Loss and Pandemic Risks, Nordic Perspectives. We are very happy to see you online. Why is Finland, in cooperation with the other Nordic countries and the UN Association of Germany, co-organizing a webinar on biodiversity loss and pandemic risks? First of all, the theme is now probably more topical than ever. We are living in a situation characterized by multiple crises. The most obvious is the COVID-19 crisis. The pandemic has also highlighted another crisis that we are experiencing, the biodiversity crisis. As we all know, by biodiversity we mean the variety of plant and animal life. Biodiversity is integral to the well-being of our planet and the people who live on it. We know that the loss of the variety of plant and animal life is both a direct and indirect threat to our well-being and health. To give one very typical example, biodiversity loss increases the risk of emergence of diseases transmitted from animals to humans, the so-called zoonotic diseases. There is an emerging body of scientific evidence to suggest that COVID-19 is likely to have a zoonotic origin. So the two crises we are experiencing are interlinked. On the other hand, we also know that diverse, healthy ecosystems protect us from diseases. They weaken the pathogens and act as a buffer against diseases. Thus, Protecting the variety of plant and animal life will also help us to prevent possible future pandemics. So the mathematics is very clear. In order to increase our own well-being on this planet and to prevent future pandemics, we need to protect our plant and animal species and prevent biodiversity loss. But global development is going to the wrong direction. Also in Finland, Despite global objectives that we have committed to, we haven't been able to halt biodiversity loss. But, real, uh, but we realize that the problems uh, we are facing require immediate action. To us Finns, it's clear that we have to be very ambitious. Finland strives to achieve climate neutrality by 2035 and carbon negativity soon after that. The government has also agreed to halt the decline of biodiversity in Finland. To achieve concrete results, we need to address the topic within and without our own borders, as ecosystems don't have political borders. The Finnish government is also committed to continuing the Nordic climate cooperation and to strengthening the position of Nordic countries as leaders in the international climate policy. The European Union is obviously an important framework for our climate action and ambition. The EU is and should be a global trendsetter in its climate and biodiversity policies. And obviously, we need ambitious, urgent action at the global level too. The final global level, level decision making at the 15th Conference of Parties has been postponed to spring 22. Our objective is clear. We aim for a new ambitious framework to halt biodiversity loss by 2030. To conclude, on a more philosophical point, action requires awareness. I hope that this webinar will help to increase awareness on this very important topic. I wish you all a successful virtual event and fruitful discussions. Thank you, Excellency. I also would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the United Nations Association of Germany. We are glad to have the chance to partner again with the Nordic embassies in making this event possible. My name is Oliver Hasenkamp. I am working for the United Nations Association of Germany um, and will be the moderator of today's event and especially of the panel discussion that we have later on with our distinguished 
guests from various Nordic countries. I'm pleased that we now, before we come to the discussion in the second part of this event, um, have the chance to hear some keynote remarks from Margrit Orken. Margrit is from Denmark and is member of the European Parliament since 2004 and currently she serves as a member of the Committee for Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. And most importantly for us today, she works on biodiversity issues for many, many years or even decades. So we, we are very glad that you are here with us uh, today, Margaret, and um, I'm very much looking forward to your experience and your insights uh, on biodiversity and um, the floor is yours. Yes, I have been in it for decades. I was uh, 20 years in the Danish parliament before I came to the European parliament, that's true. And I must say, in all these times, the situation has it deteriorated. It's, now it's really bad. Uh, ecosystem, plants and animals living in them are dwindling across the world, both on land and in lakes, rivers, and in oceans too. In Europe, more than half of bird species are not in a good conservation status. With, uh, while the number of species in bad status is increasing. And at the same time, only 50% of our valuable habitats are in a good status. And also here, the overall trend is of further deterioration. We know the causes. We know that intensive agriculture, fisheries, urbanizations, forestry, and pollutions are some of the main pressures on nature. Increasingly, climate change is, is becoming a more important factor as it amplifies other pressures and creates still more extreme conditions. The nature's bad status is a huge threat to human well-being, as we mentioned before. We depend on healthy and well-functioning ecosystems for everything from food, water, clean air, resources, and stable and livable environments. But also, as said, for our general health, zoonotic diseases Jumping from animals to humans account for around one-fifth of all infection diseases. And the more we push nature, the more we create conditions for few diseases to jump to humans. We see it happens. Similarly, the way we raise animals for food is also conductive for zoonotic diseases that can spread rapidly. And finally, for overconsumption of antimicrobials, in agriculture and medical practice is po uh, posing a uh, humongous threat to, to our ability to cure the diseases. Our destruction of nature and loss of biodiversity is alarming, and yet it receives way less attention than the climate emergency, although the COVID-19 pandemic has brought more attention to that part of the topic for at least a moment. There is still a prevalent notion that nature is something apart from ourselves and that is not really needed to consider its importance. This is madness. We must reframe the situation to give much more serious attention to the catastrophic consequences of the destruction of nature. We often see a false opposition between climate and nature. They are not conflicting. They can even be supporting each other as we see it with uh, coastal, uh, coastal sea-based uh, wind farms where you create nature under the sea, you know, the sea bottom is very often ignored. And in Denmark, 70% of the seabed is dead. And that means that have, if you can create nature by placing coastal wind farms, you can really be, be a, a gift to birds, fishes, nature, it's not very often recognized, but it should be much more. And I will tell you, celebrate with us every time we manage to raise these wind farms. But we should at least always teach ourselves uh, never to say climate without nature and vice versa. The two crises are deeply intertwined and are caused by many of the same issues in society. They can and must be solved together. We need a nature law. We finally have an EU climate law, although it leaves a lot to wish for, the, for in ambition. 
and we need a nature law too with legally binding targets in independent science councils and uh, so on and so forth. We need it now and it must be ambitious. We are waiting for the uh, European Council proposal for nature restoration legislation, but protection also needs to be in law. We, pretend, we depend, as it will be stressed many times, on a healthy and thriving nature. Without, in, uh, it, without it, we are nothing. And let me remind you, we are very close to the 60 years anniversary of a very important book, which came out in 1962, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring. It was a wake up call to many, many of us. I remember I was a very young girl at that time, but I remember uh, important people close to me start to talking about what is happening because of pesticides at that time, extremely pesticides was there, but we saw it. And there I must stress after all these years with heavy battles for nature, not only for environment, but for, you know, the nature itself, including the nature in the sea, that if we don't fight for nature as we fight for our children, we will lose that. We will lose that battle. We must consider nature, planet Earth, as important as ourselves, and, uh, and if we don't, we will be up in a competition with jobs, with economic growth, with all, the, all this, you will see it already now. And these threats are more uh, threats to us if nature is killed, it's more uh, dangerous than everything else, but take it into your heart, fight for it, and Love the birds, love all the nature you don't see, love the uh, nature in the sea. And uh, do it, of course, to keep your health safe, safe. That's very important. But also do it for the sake of nature and planet Earth. And we must be much better. And we can do it if we really now put all the forces into this battle. We have the knowledge. We have the means. We only need quite a lot more political will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Margaret, for these valuable insights and for, yes, also for these um, quite political um, remarks calling upon all of us to do more for biodiversity, to stop biodiversity loss. Um, I think you already covered um, quite a number of issues that we will also at least touch upon in the, in the following debate. So thank you um, very much, Margaret. Um, and um, I'm very glad now to introduce to all of you um, the speakers we have for this um, panel debate from various, um, uh, with, with various different backgrounds ranging from uh, scientists to civil servants, chief negotiators and youth activists and um, I hope we can have a very inspiring discussion um, here on um, on the podium. I would like to welcome Kristin Torsrud Tayen. She's biologist and research director of the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. Charlotta Zerquist, she's the chief biodiversity negotiator of Sweden and currently also serves as the chairperson of the subsidiary body um, on implementation of the Convention on Biological Diversity of the United Nations, the CBD. I would like to welcome Annika Lepistö. She's a founding board member of the organization Regeneration 2030, but also um, part of several other youth projects, including the Nordic Youth Biodiversity Network, for example. She's from the um, Eland Islands, an autonomous region of Finland. And I would like to welcome um, Sigrun August Dott here. She's the director of the Environment Agency um, of Iceland. All panelists will um, have the chance to introduce themselves and their work a little bit more in detail in a moment. But please allow me um, to give you a few information already at this point um, on how you can engage in the discussion later on. After we have heard the introductory statements of each of the panelists, we start um, with a moderated panel discussion and you have the chance to 
um, pose your questions to the podium in written form via the Q&A function of Zoom that you find in the Zoom menu bar, um, usually on the bottom side of your computer screen. So please um, use this function to um, make us aware of your questions and um, we will love to include these questions in our discussion later on. And I would like to start um, with you, Kristen. Um, I already mentioned that you are research director of the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, uh, shortly called NINA. Um, can you briefly tell us a little bit more uh, what NINA is doing and share with us uh, from a scientific perspective what are the major challenges uh, for the protection of biodiversity in Norway and maybe also in some other countries if, if you also focus your research on, on examples from other, other regions? Thank you. Uh, yes, as you said, I'm a research, dear participants, I'm a research director in NINA, which is a Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. I'm um, prepared to say, uh, say a little bit about the biodiversity conservation in Norway from our perspective and the status for that work. And uh, Nina is working with many parts of the knowledge base in the biodiversity conservation work. As we all know, nature is fundamental to our existence and quality of life. Uh, and the IPBS report from 2019 uh, had some serious conclusions about the status of nature in the world. As much as 75% of the Earth's land areas have changed significantly, as a result of this, one million species are threatened with extinction. In Norway, the situation is not so severe as on the global level. However, we still have challenges. The Norwegian nature has a huge variation in geology, landscapes, habitat types and species, both on land and in sea and freshwater. So what is the status for the Norway's nature conservation. Norway has three national targets for biodiversity that were adopted by the parliament in 2016. The first of these targets is that ecosystems shall be in good ecological condition and deliver ecosystem services. The second target says that threatened species and habitats should be safeguarded. And the third target says that a representative selection of the Norwegian nature should be protected and conserved for coming generations. Uh, Nina is working with all these, uh, the knowledge base for, for many of these, or for all these targets, and I'm going to tell a little bit more about the status for these targets. The status and trends for the first national target are shown by the Norwegian Nature Index that Nina has been developed for, you know, for and worked with for many years. It shows the status and trends for biodiversity in the main ecosystems. Uh, I will come back to the Nature Index later in the debate and uh, tell a little bit more about what it is. Uh, but the Nature Index shows it differ the, the status for the different ecosystems differs. Uh, some ecosystem systems have quite good uh, condition. However, uh, in open lowland, in wetlands and in the forest, uh, the, the value is quite low compared to the reference state. A new knowledge system for ecological condition is being developed. Nina is leading the research on how we can be able to measure condition based on different data sources. The knowledge system is not only measuring biodiversity as done by the nature index, it will also be important for knowing ecosystems ability to contribute with ecosystem services. This is also recognized by the UN as a new standard for ecosystem accounting has been launched this spring. For the target two, the red list shows status and trends for, for threatened or endangered species and habitats. Uh, the Norwegian red list for species uh, shows that 2,355 species are endangered. These accounts for 11.3% of the assessed species. Most threatened species live in forests and in the cultural landscape. Land use, land use changes and fragmentation has most impact on endangered species. Norway has also developed a red list for habitat types in different main ecosystems, and most certain habitat types are in wetlands, mountains, forests, and within landscape types. Land use change is the most important pressure also on habitat types. So what is the status for target number three? 
Well, more than 17.5% of the land area is now protected. However, the distribution of protection between different habitat types varies a lot. Norway has, for example, protected many mountainous areas and relatively little forest areas and marine and coastal areas. So the target of representative protection within 2020 was not met. Even though the targets are not met, there have been many important milestones in Norwegian nature conservation in the past 20 years. Some examples, the Norwegian Biodiversity Center, Archdottobanken, was established in 2005. The Nature Diversity Act from 2009 was important for the nature conservation. And many knowledge systems have been developed where Nina and other research institutes institutions have been central in, the, in this work. And finally, the, biodiversity, the Norwegian Biodiversity Action Plan, Nature for Life, was adopted by the Parliament in 2016. As a result of this action plan, the first strategy or management plan for a main ecosystem was launched in June this summer. That was a nature strategy for wetlands. So, all in all, a lot of positive things have happened. However, the indicators show that Norway still has a long way to go in order to reach the national targets. Uh, for the targets to be met, Norway needs to reduce negative impacts on the ecosystems and improve the ecological condition. This will include nature restoration of degraded ecosystems. Furthermore, all relevant sectors have to work towards the same targets. This means real integration, cooperation, and that all sectors take environmental responsibility. It is also important with a clear political will, priority, and clear uh, responsibilities for following up the targets. So that was a short sum up of the Norwegian situ situation and some of the work Nina has been working with in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Kristen. Um, looking forward to the further debate uh, and discussion, um, for example, on the Norwegian Nature Index later on. Um, but now I would like to turn from the rather national level to the international level. Um, Charlotta, you're the chief biodiversity negotiator of Sweden. Um, in a few weeks, uh, the first part of the 15th conference of the parties um, of the Convention um, on Biological Diversity, the CBD, uh, will start in a virtual format. Um, I think while the major part of the conference has been postponed to Kunming in China um, to April next year. Um, given that not all of us um, follow these negotiations closely, can you maybe as a starting point share a little bit of insights with us um, about the current state of the negotiations and some expectations towards um, this upcoming conference. Yes, thank, thank you, Oliver, and I'm happy to be here today. And uh, of course, I'm happy to give some information on the ongoing negotiations. First, my name is Charlotte Sörqvist. I work at the Ministry of Environment in Sweden as a chief negotiator for the CBD. But as Oliver mentioned, I'm also during this period, I'm chair of uh, one of the subsidiary bodies of CBD, subsidiary body on implementation. And uh, this uh, body discuss and uh, prepare recommendation for draft decisions on all issues that relates to enhanced implementation, such as resource mobilization, capacity building, mainstreaming, reporting, monitoring, and review. So that, that is my 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 part that I follow mostly in these uh, negotiations. But first, I would like to say a little thing about where, where we are in the negotiation. And as mentioned, biodiversity and its ecosystem services are fundamental to human well being and the health of the planet. And despite ongoing efforts, biodiversity deteriorating worldwide, and this decline, unfortunately, is con projected to continue or worsen under the business as usual scenario. And there is really need to cooperate and work together within the Convention on Biological Diversity. This uh, one of the three Rio Conventions is very important in this field, it has its three objectives to, to, to protect and, and use biodiversity sustainably and, uh, and to um, and, and we protect with sharing on the benefit derived from use with genetic resources. And we have 
as many of you know, a Convention Strategic Plan, 2011 to 2020, and its 20 IG targets. Those targets expired in 2020, and as or I think also one of the panelists already said, we have not fulfilled them yet, so we still much to do. So the plan is that a new post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be developed and decided at the next conference of parties, COP15, and that will build on and replace the existing strategic plan and its targets. It was a plan that COP15 should take place last year, uh, but uh, well, I think many of you know that the negotiations has been postponed in, in this CBD, as in many other areas, because of a pandemic. But uh, even if the negotiations have been postponed, we have had informal discussions and we have also started to try to have some virtual formal sessions. So discussions are now ongoing and will continue. We ha have had several virtual meetings, both last year and this year. And the, both of the Convention Subsidy Bodies, SAPSA, the Scientific Body, and SBI, where I'm chair, have had virtual meetings. We had a formal meeting over May and June this year. And it was very important to actually have those meetings because there are a need to have discussions in those to give guidance together with a lot of discussions and thematic consultations on the next global framework. So based on the outcome from meetings that took place in May and, and June this year, and on together with other consultations and, uh, and thematic consultations, a new draft, draft one of a new global framework was, was presented in mid-July this year. Maybe you've heard about draft one. This is a document that we're now discussing. This draft one proposes uh, a new way to, to fulfill the objectives of the convention. We have uh, four goals to be achieved by 2050 and 21 action-oriented targets of 2030. The framework's fear of change assumes that the transformative actions are taken to put in place tools and solutions for implementation and mainstreaming, reduce the threats to biodiversity, and ensure that biodiversity is used sustainably in order to meet people's needs and that these actions are supported by enabling conditions and adequate means of implementation. In August, this year, the Open and the Working Group on the Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, that is a special working group that has a task to, do, to negotiate this new framework, convene virtually to discuss and comment on this first draft. We just had the first round of comments. I mean, virtual meeting has its limitations, as you know, um, but uh, Still, we, we were able to go through all goals and targets and milestones and have the first round of comments. And the reports on the meeting will form a basis for discussions at the resume session that would expect it to reconvene as an in-person meeting, hopefully, in January 2022. So, what will happen now? We had this meeting in August. We have reports and meeting, but we also have a meeting ahead, COP15, that will take place in two parts. Whose country, China, and the CBD Secretariat has announced date for Union Biodiversity Conference, which includes COP15 to convene in two parts. COP15, part one, will be a hybrid meeting, and will take place 11th to 15th October this year. It will officially open the meetings of the convention and its protocols. It will take a decision on the budget for next year. And the meeting will also include a high level segment for two days that we hope will give political guidance for the process. So this opening meeting will address agenda items that are essential to the continued operations of the convention and its protocols, but it will not have uh, any real substantive discussions just on budget. 
that will be taking place next year when we do a meeting face to face. So first we have COP15 part one in October. Next step is a meeting that will take place in January 12th to 28th of January in Geneva, hopefully, in-person meeting with both reconvene meeting of SAPSTA, SPI, and the Open Energy Work Group on POST 2020. It will be, well, I, I think it will be quite many things we'll have discussed on that, those meetings. Uh, the SAPSTA and SPI will try to, to conclude its uh, discussions and um, the draft recommendations for the COP decisions. And we will continue our discussions on this draft one of the Global Biodiversity Framework and prepare for the decisions that hopefully will take place at COP15 part two that is announced to take place in Kunming, China, April, May next year. So to conclude, even if negotiations have been delayed, and I'm very sorry about that, work is progressing. And I do hope we will be able to meet soon again and advance our work because we really need to come make progress and so we can be able to take decisions next year in Kunming. I think I stopped there, thanks. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, now I would like to come um, to you, Annika. Um, Annika, can you first of all tell us a little bit more about um, Regeneration 2030 and um, the goals of this organization? Um, and then secondly, tell us um, from, from your perspective as a young person, as a young person who is engaged in various different contexts on biodiversity, um, what is your perspective on, on biodiversity loss? What, what um, are your, your impressions um, you, you get when you talk to other young people about biodiversity? Is this an issue that is of interest to young, to young persons? Um, is it, are there maybe some, some fears even um, that it becomes a very, very huge issue um, in, in the future? And maybe um, you also can already start to, to add some, some remarks on what are your expectations as a young person um, on the international negotiations. Yes, thank you. And thank you for letting me be here today. My name is Annika and uh, I live here on the Eiland Islands and um, I'm originally from Finland. And uh, yes, I'm a youth activist, or I like to think of myself as a backseat activist, as someone who helps other young people to um, get engaged with the issues that they are concerned about. So I like to think of myself as, as more of a backseat activist, actually. And yes, uh, as mentioned, uh, I was a founding board member of the Regeneration 2030 Foundation. And uh, it's uh, the governing board of the Regeneration 2030 movement. So this is a youth movement in the Nordics and Baltic Sea regions. And uh, it's, it's quite a large youth movement for uh, sustainability, but mainly for uh, circular economy and uh, of course, sustainable consumption and production. So uh, Regeneration 2030 actually started out uh, on Orland Islands uh, and it was actually a youth initiative and it started out from the uh, from the local uh, sustainability agenda and the local sustainability vision. So that's how it started and then it basically grew uh, and now the movement uh, is, is quite large and there are a lot of young people uh, engaged within Regeneration 2030 today. And um, the Regeneration 2030 foundation, the vision for, for the foundation and for the movement is to create a, uh, a Nordic and Baltic Sea region where sustainable consumption and production is the norm. And uh, this is something that many have asked me and others within Regeneration why uh, sustainable consumption and production. Well, because that's pretty much the problem we have here in the North. Uh, and it's in many ways the key to, to also solving other sustainability issues. So um, that's why we chose the focus on sustainable consumption and production within Regeneration 2030. 
And recently, we actually had our top meeting, our regeneration week, uh, where we actually developed a declaration for the movement. And this declaration was also handed over to EU Commissioner Virginius Sinkevicius. Uh, and we also will come up with position papers. Those are uh, coming up as well. And uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm also, of course, active in other projects, such as the Nordic Project for Biodiversity and Youth Engagement. Uh, and I've been part of the project since 2019. Uh, and we actually developed a position paper uh, for the Nordic region, uh, the Nordic Youth uh, Position Paper for Biodiversity. And uh, this position paper is out. Uh, and uh, basically we gathered uh, 3000 uh, opinions from youth uh, that resulted in 19 demands for biodiversity. Uh, and we are touching upon areas such as um, education, involvement, but also facing up to our ecological footprint and of course, uh, sustainable production and the post 2020 global framework. So there's a lot in, in the position paper uh, on biodiversity that we developed as part of the Nordic project that I'm also active in. And this project was started by the Nordic Council and the Nordic Council of Ministers in collaboration with youth in the Nordics. And uh, yeah, uh, Apart from that, I'm also, of course, uh, politically active uh, in my, my spare time. But uh, on to the question about the youth perspective, and this is something that is really interesting because I think a lot of youth today are coming to realize that we will not live in an as prosperous world as previous generations if we don't uh, completely change our behaviors, uh, our production, consumption, and our relationship to nature. And something that is uh, really interesting is what we found from, from the survey that we did to, uh, to be able to make the Nordic Youth uh, position paper on biodiversity. And uh, over uh, 2000 youth actually answered uh, and four out of five of those youth are actually very concerned about biodiversity loss. So it is definitely something that youth in the Nordics, uh, but also of course in other places are concerned about. So uh, it's not only climate, it's also biodiversity loss is an issue according to youth. And um, yeah, I think youth have also come with some great ideas and you know new viewpoints uh, because youth are actually in many ways the driving engine for for new ideas and perspectives. And um, when talking to other youth, I uh, see a lot like another way of seeing uh, sustainability or seeing the world that youth notice the importance of nature and uh, not only uh, the immediate issues that we have, that nature is actually very important and should be uh, as important as uh, decisions uh, regarding ourselves that Margarete was mentioning. We should be considering nature as much as we are considering ourselves. And I think youth have also come to realize that we should actually uh, when thinking about ecological, social, and economic sustainability, uh, we need to think about uh, it from another perspective uh, and not only think about uh, economics and how to, to drive growth, but that comes later when nature and people are thriving, because if nature and people are not thriving, then how will the economy thrive? So I think youth actually have a lot to come with and a lot of ideas and uh, should be considered also in decision making because of our perspectives and ideas. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing with all of you and this is, this is a really important topic. Thank you, Annika. Um, and I would like to come to uh, Sigrun. Um, I already mentioned that you're the director of the Environment Agency of Iceland. 
and um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what are the main objectives of these um, uh, of this agency and um, maybe you can also elaborate a little bit more in general on what or how actually um, an administrative agency like yours can uh, contribute to the protection of biodiversity and the natural environment more in general. Thank you, Oliver. I'm very pleased to meet you all. Uh, I would so much like to be in Berlin right now, the beautiful gardens, the tea garden, for example. But uh, this is uh, a new reality and new possibility to speak together on the web, which we are using much more. And I love it as well. And um, much less emissions, <laughs> right? But uh, the Environment Agency of Iceland uh, manages over 100 uh, protected areas. And now over the last three years, there has been a special effort on uh, protecting of uh, areas. And we have now uh, many more. And uh, next year, there's gonna be a, a special emphasis on protecting of species, the management plants. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, we have a rather broad role. We are managing chemicals, uh, wildlife. Uh, we are uh, issuing the report on uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, eco labeling, waste management, water protection, and so on. Uh, we are now uh, emphasizing the link between uh, protection of nature, of wetlands, and climate issues. Uh, there was a great encouragement from Margaret to do so. And uh, the habitats, the wetland habitats are very important to many plant and animal species and also uh, a great carbon storage. So now we are trying to use uh, protecting, uh, protection of areas uh, by reclaiming and also protecting wetlands. Um, there has been a great use of wetlands in uh, agriculture in, in Iceland, and uh, there are quite many ditches, many more than we are using, and uh, we are trying to reclaim some of that wetland. So we have a quite uh, more of the protected areas, we have a quite new uh, important bird area in the Westfjord, its name is Lautrabjörg. And uh, there are quite uh, many important bird species. So we are very happy to uh, have that area now, uh, managing that area. Uh, I could also tell you a little bit about Surtse uh, in the south of Vestmanair Island. Uh, it's, a, it's a laboratory <laughs> protected area and uh, only scientists are allowed to go there. Biologists and geologists go there every year to research how life is forming there. It erupted in 1963 and has been protected ever since. So uh, there are many opportunities and what we have to uh, do is work closely together. And I think we need a very broad view to uh, use all the uh, opportunities of protection of bio biodiversity. Uh, not to try to work in silos and very small boxes, but work all together on a, on a local level, a European level, national level, to, to use all the opportunities. So this was my opening remark. Thank you very much, Sigrun. Um, then I now would like to invite um, all of um, you in the audience as well, once again, to um, use the opportunity to um, post your questions via the Q&A function. Um, we already received a number of questions. Of course, I also have, have some questions uh, prepared, um, but please feel free to, um, to provide us uh, with your additional questions. Um, first um, of all, um, I would like to give you, Kristin, the chance um, to tell us a little bit more about the Norwegian Nature Index, because you already mentioned earlier that you would uh, like to elaborate a little bit more on that later on. Um, but maybe you also can add some remarks on um, whether your research has shown um, specific reasons why, as you mentioned earlier, there are in Norway um, quite a lot montaneous regions 
um, being protected areas, but not so much forests. Are there any any reasons for that? Maybe is is that related to to certain kinds of economic use, or are there any other reasons that would be something I'm very interested in? Thank you. Uh, I can start out with the, to tell a bit more about the nature index, and I will come back to your questions about the protected areas. Uh, the nature index that uh, yeah, Nina has been very central in developing the nature index, and the work started actually in 2007, eight already. And the nature index shows status and trends for biodiversity, as I said, in different ecosystems. Um, they are shown as a, the index is shown, uh, uh, shows a value between zero and one compared to a reference value of one. And it is based on a number of indicators for each ecosystem. The indicators are based on monitoring, modeling, and expert assessments. And each of them are scaled, as I said, between zero and one. Uh, the indicators are grouped by major functional groups and they have varied spatial and temporal resolution. Um, do you want me to tell about the what the nature index shows as well? Because, uh, because then the, you aggregate up the indicators for each um, ecosystem and, and it is shown on map by different colors and they show both the status compared to the reference date and also uh, the de development during the past uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, and there is an, uh, it's a web page that where you can show, you can have a look at the different, the results for the different main ecosystems and also uh, thematic indicators. Uh, and you asked about the, why it differs so much uh, when it comes to protection of different ecosystems. Uh, in Norway, they made a, a national park plan in 1991 and pointed out uh, areas that were, could be uh, national parks. That was mostly in mountains. Uh, in the 80s, they started also to protect forests, but it has been very, a lot of conflicts around it, and it is due to economical reasons and forestry, of course. So therefore, protection of forests have been going much more slowly. So now the protection of forests is, I think it's around 5.4 percent uh, but they have the parliament has decided that it's supposed to reach 10 percent thank and you also, and the protection of marine areas and coastal areas uh, have, uh it, that work has also been very difficult due to conflicts and yeah it's it has not uh, been much easier to protect the mountainous areas because of less economic uh, conflicts actually Thank you, Kristen. Um, Sigrun, you also mentioned um, that um, you plan uh, a couple of new protected areas in Iceland. What is, your, what is your experience from Iceland when you plan new protected areas? Um, how do you deal with conflicts of interest? What, what are major challenges? How do you make sure to, to try to um, to get local populations, maybe even local companies on board to protect the idea or uh, to, to support the idea of protected um, areas. How, how do you deal with these conflicts of interest that probably also do exist in Iceland? Thank you, Oliver. This is very interesting. There, is, there are always different aspects of land use. And it's just like Christian said, uh, it's often, often it's more easy uh, in the mountains, but it's not that simple though, because people, people in Iceland uh, have been, they say, uh, protecting the mountains them, themselves. So we have uh, recently had a, a quite big debate on protecting uh, the highland. But uh, we have a, a rather new study on uh, economic benefits of protected areas. And we have a lovely example in the west of Iceland, Snæfellsjökull Stilgarður. You'd be happy to try to pronounce that. <laughs> Where we have this uh, beautiful uh, glacier, which I can see from my house. Uh, the companies in, in that area, they have uh, received a, of their opinion uh, economical benefits of uh, the national park. So we need more studies like, like that, more good stories and, uh, and a good and fruitful discussion by all parties in, involved. 
and uh, there is an uh, obligation in Icelandic leg legislation to consult all interest parties, uh, landowners, municipalities, and so on. And we need deep discussion before we protect uh, an area also uh, so that uh, the management of the area could be uh, very good and uh, fruitful also. So uh, this is key. Thank you, Sigrun. I um, also would like to open up this aspect on how to maybe involve private businesses and what is the role of economy or industry because we um, have received quite, quite a number of questions on that already um, to, to the whole podium. I'm, I'm not sure whether um, Annika or Charlotte, uh, any one of, of you also um, may would like to add something on this broad, broad um, aspect maybe um, Charlotte you can you can tell us a little bit um, on also on um, yeah how 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 much the, the role of industry played a role in the negotiations also how you deal with different stakeholders uh, in the negotiations are there any non-governmental organizations any businesses involved as observers in the negotiations Yes, yes, thank you for the question. Well, first, I think um, uh, the whole plan to develop this new global framework is uh, is planned to be participatory and uh, open. So it's um, we have had a lot of, of uh, thematic consultation and discussions with not only parties to the convention, but also to different stakeholders and stakeholder groups. So I think it has been a period when we have had uh, a lot of discussions because of course when you come to the negotiations it is a negotiation between parties but still the observers are very active it has been some limitations in the virtual format um, because of time uh, you, you have it limited in of time and due to, to time constraint time zones uh, and challenges so even if we have a uh, and our talk as a chair, I mean, even if I try to get all the observers to be able to speak, it's not always possible to do that. But I think still that we have had a quite participatory process. Uh, and now to the question about the businesses and financial sector. Absolutely. I mean, this, this new framework should be a framework for all. And it, it's, a, it's not only for limited scientists that know it. it should be something that relates to everybody. Uh, and there are uh, um, specific target in, in the proposed, in the in a draft framework that addresses businesses to, to both uh, assess and report on the dependencies and impact on biodiversity from local to global, um, to reduce negative impacts, and also talk about this full sustainability of, of um, the source and supply chains. But then we talk about the financial sector is also very, very important. And we have had, uh, there have been special discussions with the financial sectors uh, in order to, it has become more and more um, knowledge about the risk of biodiversity it also relates to the financial sector as well. So they are also very aware and they want to be involved. So um, we are trying to see where it can fit also in the framework. But I think the important thing is that when we have a new framework in place, it should be targets and to, 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 when we come to the implementation phase, it should be somewhere that everybody, all related stakeholders should, be, should know what they can do and how they can, can, can make uh, to make sure that we can reduce the loss of biodiversity and also to help uh, to have a better, better development. I think I Thank you, there. Charlotta. Um, Annika, you also mentioned um, in your introductory remarks um, that um, how can there actually be economy if, if we um, continue on, on the path of biodiversity loss and of course of, of um, the path of climate change in future. So do you have any, any specific um, ideas how the, the, the way we, um, we do business today, 
the way our economy looks today needs to be transformed in order to make sure that we can um, stop biodiversity loss? Yes, thank you for the question. So I think one very important aspect uh, and something that needs to happen is that we need to move from a linear economy to a circular economy. And um, of course, uh, this is all about resources and using resources sustainably and uh, not just making a product and then using it for a while and or maybe not using it at all and then throwing it away. And actually during the uh, regeneration week, we discussed some uh, areas or some themes uh, where uh, everyone from individuals to businesses can do, um, can make changes that will uh, actually lead to, to more circularity or, you know, that will have an impact on sustainability. And uh, we talked about uh, the area of food, uh, the area of stuff or the theme of stuff, money, uh, moving and uh, fun and uh, these are actually part of the uh, of uh, a framework uh, that that UNEP has developed uh, the anatomy of action framework uh, and um, this is a good way of um, getting a bit more concrete like where can we actually make a difference and where can all of us make a difference and um, this is of course about circular economy as well, and that uh, we need to have more efficient way of, um, of using resources and we need to use them more sustainably and uh, not um, have a linear economy where we just throw everything away. Um, and of course, finance is also very important. And uh, I remember reading this report, Bankrolling Extinction, uh, and uh, it was basically about that large um, amount of banks are uh, investing money into uh, funds or into uh, not so sustainable um, companies or uh, actions that they are actually bankrolling uh, extinction. Uh, and we of course need to move away from that as well. But uh, the good thing is that uh, businesses have started to realize this and um, they have started to engage in dialogues with youth, for example. And um, I remember one uh, one person at the Regeneration Week, uh, uh, actually a CEO, um, he said uh, that the important thing is to start, to take the first step towards becoming more sustainable. And this is something that we all can do. And this is something that um, businesses, youth, uh, decision makers, all of us can do this and should do this. Thank you. Um, Annika, um, when it comes to sustainable economy, of course, um, we also have to talk about sustainable consumption because all of us um, can contribute to a more sustainable um, uh, economy. and. Um, Sigrun, um, the Environment Agency of Iceland is also in charge of something that you call eco-labeling, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about what is eco-labeling and how can it um, contribute to um, stopping biodiversity loss? Yes, thank you. Um, we are very proud of the Nordic Swan, the Nordic countries. It's uh, maybe similar to the uh, European flower that you might be more familiar with in, in Germany, I guess. And um, it, the Nordic Swan is, is uh, yeah, a rather strict eco labeling, we think. And according to the rules of the Swan labeling, uh, you're not supposed to use certain endangered wood types. So in, in that way, uh, the labeling supports biological diversity. And I'm also happy to tell you that the renovation of the house I'm working in here in Reykjavik is eco-labeled, the first of the Nordic countries. And there is a, there is a movement in Iceland in eco-labeling of buildings, which I'm very happy uh, about. We actually had to uh, uh, have more staff to uh, be able to uh, work on all those projects. Um, might I add a little bit regarding industry? Sure. Um, 
all new industry is supposed to have an environmental uh, impact assessment. And the company can use that by running the business. Uh, environmental uh, management uh, plan and uh, labeling uh, and uh, inspection of those plans is also supporting uh, industry uh, by uh, in biological diversity as all environmental aspects. Just a little point. Thank you, Sigrun. Um, we have a question um, on and I think that um, um, adds very well to what we just discussed uh, in terms of eco-labeling. Um, what private people can do to protect the biodiversity. So um, do you have any ideas next to eco-labeling and of course um, related to that um, more sustainable consumption? Um, what individuals, particularly in the Nordic countries or in Germany maybe, can do to contribute to stop biodiversity loss, even though it's maybe only a, a small contribution. Yeah, uh, buy eco-labeled products, of course. And just like Anneke said, we have to move towards a circular economy. And we are happy to see now uh, more and more shops, uh, popular shops with used clothes and so on. So uh, I, I think we're Starting to think more, it's, um, there are more awareness by the public now. I'm very happy to see that. And I also saw a question on, on that. So um, I'm also very hopeful uh, towards the young people. So I applaud the emphasis of having the young voice here, Anaka. Thank you. Um, we have to listen. And I, I just see on, on the screen I have in front of, of me that Margaret would like to also um, well, kind of join this panel discussion and contribute to this question. Of course, I uh, would uh, love to give the, you this opportunity. So, um, Margaret, of course, uh, please, yes. please, you have the word. Yes, thank you very much because I love this question. And I think, of course, we can do a lot uh, apart from participating in the general debate and not be, you know, not be reluctant to really fight for nature. What we can do is to make our gardens, our cities, with much more wild nature. We have a fantastic project in Denmark where we, through television and so on, uh, are campaigning for how you turn your, your garden into this green lawn desert as they have been for a long time. And uh, then have, uh, you know, what's called wheat uh, uh, before. And lots of, you know, flowers and everything for insects, for for uh, butterflies and so on. And I saw, and that was just a good remark. I was sent to Germany. I was uh, leaving Frankfurt Airport. Sorry, I fly too much. But uh, I was leaving Frankfurt uh, uh, Airport the other day. And there I saw in all the green fields, you saw that, that they had had the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, they only had the grass, uh, cut just at the outside around, and then I saw white nature, or what we call it up to now, and all over the uh, at, at the uh, at, at the in the airport at the arrival arriving spaces, departure spaces, and then I looked to Castro when I arrived there, and everything you've seen the robot a robot has been out there cutting everything dead, uh, or you know down to again this desert. So I think participate in this campaign for having white nature in your city, in your village, uh, talk with farmers, tell them how important it is that they also, at least around their, their fields, have white nature and, and give it a chance. But also, yeah, every, every place you see in industry areas where they also find they look, need to look decent. And that's why they have a robot turning around the whole time, cutting everything down. No, go into this campaign and get uh, nature. And as soon as people realize this here, I also, also, also think that something happens in their mindset so that it'll be more active in general to take part in the recreation and restoration of nature. And then please don't forget the seafloor. Uh, I think it's too often forgotten because you just see the surface and you don't see how terrible it is under the seafloor. And welcome wind turbines, please, instead of, and forget NIMBY. Uh, NIMBY should be dead now, you know, not in my backyard. Should be absolutely dead now because we don't have the time 
uh, to, to have this nonsense. And uh, yes, please, that would be my little contribution here to, 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 uh, to rewildering of nature, and we need it so much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Margaret. Just as uh, a small addition, because you uh, mentioned uh, the seabed and, and, and also the oceans, which are not a major part of this discussion, of course, today, um, but just to, to briefly add, there are also several UN processes um, on that, including the ne negotiations on biodiversity beyond national boundaries, um, looking on the international seas, but very, very um, 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 current at the moment also um, the um, negotiations of the International Seabed Authority, I think, that is discussing about um, the possibilities of economic um, commercial uh, seabed mining um, um, as yeah, a possibility of, of um, getting more resources in, in future. And of course, there are also a lot of um, fears in especially indigenous societies. But you should add that. to this here, sorry to interrupt, because I have to leave now. If you know Catherine Richardson uh, in Denmark, uh, American Denmark, and she is uh, one of our famous, uh, you know, sea uh, 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 biologist, and she says always, always mention uh, the seabed, the sea together with climate, together with nature, because it's much more interlinked than just to say we also have to look at the sea. No, the sea, but they had the food of birds, and fish, creating the basis for life is in sea. And uh, we, it's not only, of course, you mentioned, and you should do when you're going to, uh, to, uh, to dig for resources and so on. Uh, we should be very careful on the building sector, not to drop too much sand and destroy the seabed, but your trawl fishery should be stopped. You know, you just, you just destroy the seabed. And I would add to this, especially from Denmark, I think Denmark, uh, is probably the worst, that the emissions from agriculture of nitrogen, phosphorus, and it's killing. It's also killing the sea. So please never forget the sea when you talk about nature, because it's not only an additional thing, as well as nature is not an additional thing to the climate. Uh, it, it's, it's really interwinkled between each other. And, you know, you're up against heavy economical interests, you know, so it is you have to, uh, you know, fight for life here because you have no alternatives. But never forget sea, the sea and the seabed. And coming from, from Denmark, you know, Iceland has probably even more surrounded by sea. But, and I don't know if, if it's so bad in Iceland. I have the fear that you could face something close to that because the North Sea uh, is also very, very damaged. Uh, so, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Just, it's not an additional thing. It's an including things in the whole fight for nature. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Annika, you also raised your hand for quite a while. Uh, do you want to add something on, on what individual people can, can contribute to biodiversity, uh, to stopping biodiversity loss, of course? Yeah, uh, I just have one short thing to add, uh, something that is really hands-on uh, that uh, uh, individuals can do. Uh, and one thing is uh, using uh, the stuff that you buy uh, for longer and, uh, of course, uh, recycling it uh, when, uh, when it gets uh, torn out or bad. Uh, so we can do a lot by just wearing, for example, the clothes that we buy and eating the food that we buy uh, and using like electronics that we buy. Um, and of course, recycling it in the right way when uh, when we have to uh, sort of throw it away. Um, and then uh, I just had uh, one more thought, and it's actually included in the Nordic Youth uh, position paper on biodiversity. Uh, and it's... Um, uh, it's this idea or this um, notion that we need to uh, that we need to think about success and well-being in another way. Uh, that um, it shouldn't be about materialistic um, goods. It shouldn't be that you have to uh, own a lot of stuff to be happy. Uh, that we also need to redefine well-being and success uh, and uh, make it more connected to uh, our connection with nature. Um, and maybe not our connection to, to stuff or our um, longing or wanting uh, for stuff, but more connected to our uh, relationship to nature. So just a couple of short things. 
Thank you, Annika. Um, Margaret already mentioned in her introductory remarks, in her, her keynote remarks, that there's a close interlinkage between climate change and biodiversity loss, of course. And uh, Kristen, <coughs> maybe you can um, tell us a little bit more from a scientific perspective, um, what are actual, actually the, the interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity? Thank you, I will try. Climate is one of the most important factors that influences species, their habitats and biodiversity as such. And human use of nature affects the climate and climate change has impacts on nature. Climate change amplifies the negative effects of biodiversity loss and degraded ecosystems. Therefore, climate change and biodiversity, as, as some said before, are very closely connected and interlinked. And the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis must therefore be solved simultaneously. We need to find win-win solutions. Finding good solutions for nature is also positive for climate. Nature store carbon corresponding to as much as 60% of global emissions per year. Even more important, nature is the basis for our lives and gives us vital ecosystem services. Uh, so therefore, we must stop negative impacts on nature, restore nature and improve ecological condition in the ecosystems. Nature-based solutions play an important role in the climate adaptation in, in the society. Uh, the climate politics has become top priority uh, and nature politics must get the same position. The IPCC land report and the first global report from the IPBS, as I mentioned before, both un underlines the several objectives must be considered and seen in context if sustainable development is to be achieved. Land use planning, uh, land planning and land use must find the best solutions for both climate and ecosystems in order to reach the sustainable development goals. The, this means that we have to conserve nature and existing carbon storages in ecosystems, try to restore biodiversity and carbon storages in ecosystems, as well as conserve areas so that they are resilient and resistant to meet the climate changes. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I think we can, can talk on the whole podium a little bit on the entire linkages between climate change and, um, and biodiversity. Um, in, in a moment, um, f first of all, I would like to give the floor to you, Charlotte. Uh, we already heard um, several times today that um, while the climate change um, movement, climate change agenda has gained quite momentum in Europe, but also I think uh, all over the world, um, this is not necessarily true for the issue of biodiversity. So. Um, um, w when you look on the international negotiations, um, would you, uh, or may maybe the first question to also take one question that um, came from the audience um, would be how, how could the awareness for the international negotiations on biodiversity be strengthened? Um, and a second part of the question could be um, when we are looking on the COVID-19 pandemic, did that result in any way in increased awareness for the negotiations? Yes, uh, thank, thank you so much for the question. Well, I, I think it's true that uh, climate change has much more attention and, and, and I mean it's um, and you can always ask, I think that is a shift ongoing regarding biodiversity, because if I just compare to for some years, I think that that um, before, I think mo mo most focus was on, on um, only on, on protection, but you know, I'm talk very much about the need to have a sustainable use of biodiversity uh, and the linkages to other areas, to the SDGs, and the the underlying <laughs> biodiversity somehow is the underlying uh, the need for all, for us all to survive, and I think it has become more apparent to many now, and also maybe caused by the pandemic that uh, there are such linkages, but also in, in climate change, of course, that you can see the, the need to have um, the interlinkages uh, here. So, uh, well. 
what can you do to make it more? I, I think we all have, to, of course, try to reach out. And I, I, as I said, I think we have had tried to have a more participatory process, maybe, and have dialogues. But of course, we need to to do our best to reach out and maybe use uh, language. And I, I think this is a challenge because sometimes when you look at the, the targets, and they are so maybe sometimes so scientific correct, but it's very not easy to communicate to a wider public. But on, on the other hand, uh, there's also questions from, I said, from business societies and others that they know that this is important, they want to do their part, but they also find it maybe difficult sometimes to understand, to, to see, uh, find a, a way to communicate to each other. So what I hope is that that this new framework will be combine both the need to have an evidence-based target, because we need to have targets that actually is linked to what needs to be done in the correct way. But on the other hand, we need to have a, a way to communicate them to a wider public so we can involve all stakeholders. And well, uh, I'm, I'm very, it's very positive to hear your suggestions, Annika, from the youth perspective, because of course I think that uh, we can learn a lot from <laughs> how to communicate and, and the, 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 the moment uh, how to actually have a more sustainable way and have more circular economy and so on. It's um, so I hope that uh, when we, I notice already that this negotiation has has great attention that people are aware that something is happening in coming next year. So let's hope that we'll have a, a start for our work ahead. Thanks. Would you agree, Charlotta, that the Agenda 2030 and um, the SDGs, as, as a, so the Sustainable Development Goals, um, agreed by the United Nations in 2015, which include, um, amongst others, SDG 15 on life on land, SDG 14, life below water, in a way maybe also SDG number six on safe drinking water, um, which also includes a lot of um, uh, um, targets on, on the protection of fresh water and, and um, yeah, fresh water ecosystems. Would you agree that uh, Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals um, help to, to raise awareness and momentum also for biodiversity? Or would you rather say it's rather lost to have this one single goal, maybe SDG 15, that really focuses on biodiversity in this huge agenda? Well, thank you for that. I think it's a bit tricky question. <laughs> I, I think the framework, I mean, the new framework would contribute to the implementation of the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, at the same time, I think a progress that was many of the Sustainable de Development Goals, as you say, will help provide conditions necessary to uh, implement the coming biodiversity framework. So absolutely, I mean, there are linkages here. Um, Globally and nationally, there are clear and strong linkages between human health, climate change, food security has been raised many times. I think maybe you mentioned that, I think it's SDG 2, I think, even, but no hunger. It's also very important. That we need, um, and, and I note also in negotiations that maybe it has been raised more than before, the, the need uh, for biodiversity also to help fulfill many of the SDGs. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I, I don't think we only should to try to have targets that somehow that we need. We need. We are dependent on biodiversity, but we also need to to, to, to defend biodiversity for its own sake. So it's not only about how to to use biodiversity, but also to protect biodiversity for the well for all nature. Thanks. Thank you, Charlotta. Yeah, I, I definitely um, believe that Agenda 2030, the SDGs, can be a, a good framework that shows how interconnected um, biodiversity and many other issues are, not only to climate change, but to many other aspects. You mentioned food security, for example. Um, so, of course, uh, biodiversity is not only linked very closely to climate change, but also to many other issues. I think that's an, a very important message. Um, uh, still, I would like to um, uh, just 
for, for a short moment um, um, talk about climate change once again and how we can um, increase the awareness for biodiversity. Um, Annika, um, of course we all know the Fridays for Future movement that really got very popular here in, in Europe, in, in, in many countries. Um, and um, yeah, this um, movement is, is very much focusing really on, on, on climate change, not so much on sustainable development in general, at least here in, in Germany. Also biodiversity is not so much um, of the, in the focus of this um, movement. What do you think um, should, yeah, or have, have, has to change in order to um, include biodiversity also on the agenda of movements like Fridays for Future that uh, reach a lot of, uh, yeah, reach, reach a huge audience. Yes, thank you. And uh, this is also a, a bit of a tricky question, but uh, I'm going to do my best in answering it. And uh, I just wanted to start out to mention that um, even though Fridays for Future, for example, focuses on climate, there has also been some nice uh, acknowledgements on uh, biodiversity from, for example, Greta Thunberg. Uh, there was at least one instance when she spoke about um, ecosystems collapsing and uh, these types of issues uh, and also in her uh, summer speech. So uh, uh, there are some uh, acknowledgements uh, also, of course, from Fridays for Future. And I think uh, that, uh, well, at least if I speak from, from my perspective and from also what I've learned within Regeneration, that um, it's, it's important to kind of collect youth around this idea about a brighter future. And then, of course, there might be uh, some that are more interested in climate change, some that are interested in uh, economic sustainability, or some that are interested in social sustainability. But we are all, in the end, um, striving for the same goal uh, and striving for change. So. Uh, and of course, there are strength in numbers, and especially for young people, uh, it's it's hard to get your voice heard if you're alone. You kind of need a lot of youth behind you, uh, standing behind what you are saying. So um, I just believe that uh, if if we can find a way to come together and build more bridges uh, and strengthening the youth voice, bringing young people into more places where decisions are being made, uh, that is uh, that is for sure going to help. Uh, as um, young people uh, are, even though they might be focusing on one topic, uh, they are aware of the whole sustainability picture and uh, aware of the interlinkages between uh, ecological, social and economic sustainability, for example. So um, I believe at least for youth, it's important to come together and, and build bridges. Annika, um, Sigrun, do you um, maybe briefly want to um, add from your experience um, on the interconnectedness between climate change and um, biodiversity? What, what does it mean in, in practice um, for the work of your agency? Um, yes, just like I mentioned a little bit before, um, we have this uh, project we are working on, uh, protection of uh, wetlands for the future. Uh, because wetlands are a very important habitat for many plants and, and species, and they are also to be issued uh, a new regulation on, on plant protection. So um, yeah, I think we have to have this broad view of, of how we can uh, protect carbon storage areas and biodiversity areas at the same time. Uh, like the encouragement uh, we heard before, win-win uh, solutions. Yeah, thank you, um, Sigrun. Um, we are um, already coming um, to, the, to the end of this event, but I at least would like to maybe take two last questions um, um, also from the audience, um, because we still have, have a number of good questions from the audience, even though I'm not sure um, who of you may uh, be able to answer answer this? Uh, I, I try to to summarize the first the first question, um, which um, is uh, is about um, communes in the European Union. And um, um, the person who has stated this question 
um, state that he or she, I don't know who, who stated this question, remembers that there is the idea in Norway or Sweden um, that everyone has the right to take from nature what he or she needs in a sustainable way and um, that there are in also in other parts of Europe including South Tyrol in the Alps for example is a concept of um, joint ownership in a sustainable way um, of nature by local communities. Um, I'm not sure whether um, any one of you um, um, has a little bit of expertise on, on this field, but the question is actually um, how law could strengthen the rights of these communities either on a national level or also on a European Union level maybe. Um, and the second question which I also think is very interesting um, is about how the knowledge of local um, communities um, or also indigenous communities um, can be used um, as a vehicle to um, yeah, to stop biodiversity loss and, and protect um, nature and ecosystems. So, um, as I mentioned before, I'm not absolutely sure whether um, or wh who of you may want to, to uh, reply to any of these two questions, um, but if you feel competent to at least um, address a part of um, one of these two questions, please uh, feel free to raise your hand or just um, uh, start with your comment. Maybe I'll just shortly comment that uh, often we find uh, in the local communities uh, knowledge which we can't uh, find anywhere else. So we have, um, we all, it's very necessary to use that knowledge. Uh, we also uh, can see in several places very beautiful projects um, protecting bird life, for example. Um, there is a, a beautiful story from the Westman Islands protecting young, young birds. They fly to the lights of the, the town. And uh, in the local community, they're always uh, uh, helping the birds to fly away to their, to their own habitat. Just a little comment on local commun communities. Sigrun, um, Annika, do you maybe want to add to this question. I, I, I think I remember that in the Nordic position paper you mentioned earlier, there's also at least a brief section on indigenous communities. Uh, yes, I can add a bit uh, to this as well. Uh, and uh, yes, as you mentioned, there is uh, a section about involvement in the Nordic youth position paper on biodiversity. And um, well, we think it's important that indigenous peoples and uh, of course also local communities are involved uh, to the largest extent possible. And uh, especially uh, when it's uh, regarding land and water use. Um, and uh, of course, uh, especially also when it concerns areas where, uh, for example, indigenous peoples live. Um, and. Uh, it's very important that they are involved in decision making, but also implementation. So uh, in both uh, instances, they need to be involved. And um, I think it's they have a lot of knowledge and, and they should be heard uh, when it comes to um, issues and questions and decisions that will hugely impact their lives. Uh, and um, of course, uh, they will have a lot more knowledge about local um, conditions than someone that might not have even been there or that has just read uh, about the conditions there. So, um, of course, uh, these people uh, should, should be involved uh, and not only in decision making, but also, of course, in implementation. Thank you. Annika, Charlotta, Kristen, do you would like to add? to any of these aspects? If that's not the case, then um, I would like to um, actually close the event with another um, question, uh, another last question to you, Annika, um, especially since we started um, the, this event with the uh, keynote remarks from Margaret Orkin and her very yeah, political statement on, on what we have to, or that we have to act now. Um, I also would like to, to end the event with yeah, a, 
a view to, to current affairs in, in politics, actually. So, uh, Annika, in, in Germany and Iceland, there are uh, parliamentary elections uh, in a few days, and um, in Norway, there have been elections uh, as well uh, this month. So, as a young person, what would be your advice to the newly elected parliamentarians um, um, in order to prioritize the protection um, of biodiversity um, during their term in, in office. Yes, thank you. This is a very interesting question. And I would actually like to start off with, um, with a question uh, to, to parliamentarians or actually more of a call for action, and that is to uh, actually read uh, the Nordic Youth Position Paper on Biodiversity, as well as the Regeneration 2030 Declaration and upcoming position papers, because there's a lot of really good um, suggestions and demands uh, on biodiversity in these papers and on sustainable consumption and production. So um, these, these papers are definitely uh, worth a read. And um, yeah, I mean, consider youth uh, as someone that sh youth should be uh, involved in decision making, uh, consider youth as a given stakeholder uh, and pay attention to the involvement of youth, also when it comes to uh, decisions on biodiversity and, uh, for example, implementation of the post-2020 framework, uh, because youth are definitely uh, a group that can help uh, with this. And um, if, if I just um, conclude uh, about biodiversity specifically, um, I think there's going to be a hard time now uh, recovering from the pandemic uh, where we have to again uh, keep uh, ecological sustainability in mind while uh, thinking about economic sustainability or growth might uh, get the upper hand so there's um, there's this risk that uh, biodiversity might be forgotten uh, in our um, longing to to getting back to to some kind of normal state or, you know, getting back to, to business. But uh, it's very important that we keep in mind that uh, we cannot go back to how it was. Uh, we have to start this green transition. And now is actually a really good uh, time for that. Uh, and we know now that we can actually change and we can change really quickly if we have to. Uh, and yeah, we, we have to take biodiversity into account uh, because, um, as mentioned, uh, if nature or people aren't thriving, then uh, there will be another economic disaster uh, just around the corner. So nature and people are important uh, and they need to be considered in all decisions, not only uh, decisions regarding, uh, for example, land uh, or water use, but in all decisions, we need to take biodiversity uh, into account. Thank you very much in, indeed, um, Annika. Um, I think that was a very important point you raised um, in, in the end, that we have to mainstream biodiversity. That's uh, something um, I already discussed with a few people um, prior to, to this live ev event um, about, and I think that's a really important message. Um, I would like to thank all of you um, very much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Annika. Thank you, Sigrunz. Thank you, uh, thank you, Charlotte, for your um, expertise. I wish you all the best for your work on biodiversity, especially also for the international negotiations, um, of course. Also, thank you again, Margaret, for your um, valuable insights. I would like to also thank everyone in the audience and now would like to pass on the floor to um, Fabian Gasson. He's one of the German um, UN Youth Delegates on Sustainable Development. And um, Fabian, you will uh, try to summarize uh, this uh, very interesting um, debate and um, give the closing remarks for today. Thank you very much. You have the floor, Fabian. Yeah, thank you, Oliver, for giving me the floor. And also thank you for the invitation. Also a big thank you to all the previous speakers who found really clear words about the biodiversity crisis. I'm Fabian 
And as Oliver said, I'm one of two youth delegates for sustainable development for Germany. My colleague Sophia and I, working on the SDGs on UN level, but also on the regional and national level. With SDG 14, life underwater, and SDG 15, life on land, there are two goals that are, uh, that are specifically target addressing healthy ecosystems. We have already heard a lot about the link between climate change and biodiversity loss today, and also how strong the damage already is. It has become clear that we cannot protect the climate by finding alternatives to our destructive lifestyle, but still continue on destroying nature. Simply doing something different is not enough. We have to start giving nature more value again. I have lived my life all in Berlin. In urban areas like Berlin, we need to start unsealing the concreted areas to promote urban nature. Studies have shown that urban nature can cool down the city on hot days during summertime a lot. In our local countryside areas, direct support is needed for the foresters and the farmers. They are the ones with one of the longest and easiest working levers we have in fighting this crisis because they work with a large part of the land in our country. Linked to the sector of agriculture is also the food in its entirety. We cannot afford a destructive food lifestyle that requi requires such a huge mass on feed for animals that forests all over the world are cut down for it. All also seas get totally destroyed, as Margaret mentioned before. This neoliberal colonial way of providing ourselves by destroying the nature of others, people, countries and entire continents must come to an end. It needs a system change to form a food industry that is not harming our nature. It also needs better information and education which can help to build a new understanding which we can grow up directly as a young generation. For us, as young people, the change is usually easier because we have not spent a lifetime acquiring habits in an exploitative system, which have normalized nowadays in a destructive way of life we're living in Western societies. If upcoming generations grew up in a mostly circulating economy, we can create a new normal. Young people can and will be the engine for necessary change. Our and the future generations are the ones who have to endure the consequences of global fossil capitalism. Therefore, it is also incredibly important to involve them in meaningful, uh, meaningful in such processes as the negotiations of CBD. As we heard from Annika, we have a huge interest of being involved. We are scared on our future ecosystems. In pre preparation, for this event, I talked to the German Youth Delegation for Biodiversity. Unfortunately, we have to re realize once again that also in the process of the negotiation, there is a lot of talk about our future, but the participation does not happen on a meaningful level, but rather dominated by tokenism. My appeal to all leaders, bring young people to the negotiation table. In its spirit of a statement by the former Commissioner for Human, Human Rights, Mary Robinson, you are never too young to lead and you're never too old to learn. Based on this, I would like to use this stage here to formulate five common calls. Some of them are repeated from the contributions we already heard. But from our perspective, these are the most important ones. First, we need immeasurable goals and strong commitments on them with appropriate indicators so that the goals that are gonna be set actually can be implemented and are not simply empty promises to, that cannot kept in the way uh, in the end anyways because no focus can be set. Second, we basically, ne basically need more funding for concrete regional projects and educational work. In addition to more funding, we need to stop destructive subventions of, for example, agriculture products that mainly promote monocultures in instead of biodiversity. Third, besides the harmful subventions, we need 
an immediately stop of unnecessary destructive of uh, destruction of nature nature every biotop every small ecosystem must be protected a systematic nature proviso is needed as a co concrete political instrument to better planning from the outset the model have to be check your impact and don't destroy fourth we demand a recognizable political will from the industrialized countries and especially the European member states to finally live up on their symbolic role to implement the necessary change in its necessarily radicalness to send a signal to the world. The last point has already been addressed several times and I want gonna repeat it again. The connection between biodiversity and climate change must be acknowledged by all sides and must finally be, finally be thought into the decision-making processes together. I'm very aware that there are people sitting here who are on, on the same side as us and also fight for our future generations. That is why I understand my contribution more as a friendly reminder. It should also be an encouragement to continue our fight. We still have a hard and difficult way ahead of us, but we will go together in Generations United. Let's create a strong momentum to set biodiversity loss on the agenda of every debate on the future. The conference in October and the conference in January and the negotiation to the CBD needs to be a strong contribution that every country is following. Thank you all who are fighting for this change, no matter if it's in official committees, in local projects or in the streets. I'm really, be, I'm really happy to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fabian. Thank you Mary, very much to all of you in the audience. Thank you again to our uh, distinguished speakers. And of course, also, last but not least, thank you to everyone um, in, who was um, supporting this event from the back, including um, the technical assistance. Um, thank, thank you all, and have a, have a great day. <laughs>